one of the regular programs that we do uh, is called Applied Words. Um, and uh, this, uh, tonight's program is under that umbrella. Um, and the idea of Applied Words is to uh, connect um, artists, writers, experts, even um, outside of the art world um, in various uh, fields, um, to use uh, language as a, as a platform to have conversations of different kinds about um, contemporary social issues at the uh, local, national, um, international um, level. Uh, so we often try to combine um, either artists from uh, different disciplines or uh, writers with um, uh, people from other fields or just ask um, uh, a group of writers to get together and think um, about something that's, that's happening um, more broadly in the world in, in one way or another. Um, so really, uh, this reading, um, which uh, uh, we're calling um, uh, American Authors, Transnational Voices, um, came out of the desire of the board president of the Guild, uh, Andrea Change, uh, to do another event with uh, Natanya uh, Rosenfeld, who um, uh, did a, a really successful event with the Guild uh, last year, I think, um, uh, and, and wanted to do that again. Um, and so Natanya invited um, some writers uh, that she knew uh, to uh, do this event. And as, as it was coming together, um, uh, sort of look, looking at these, um, the writers who were going to be reading and looking at what was happening in the world, um, there was this sense that uh, uh, we could tease out from this uh, group of people uh, uh, um, some ideas about uh, what, how the transnational um, lives and works in um, America um, as, as, as we're living right now. I think it's an important time to think of um, America as a transnational place and, and, uh, and the ways that we fit into the world. And in, in all of the writers who are going to read tonight, I think there are in, in very interesting ways and different ways, we see uh, kind of the memories, the histories um, of uh, transnationalism, uh, you know, maybe not the sort of a traditional immigration story, uh, perhaps, although that might be there too, but the ways that all of, all of the voices that we call American are also always uh, transnational in one, in one way or another. And I think um, uh, that might not be the only thing uh, that defines uh, these writers or defines the, the overlap between their work, but I think it's something that by framing it in that way, hopefully we can have an, uh, an interesting conversation about or, or ask some questions about um, afterwards. But I'm sure we'll hear about very different things as well um, uh, uh, from these authors who all have very um, broad uh, practices from scholarship to poetry to fiction uh, to prose essays um, uh, and beyond uh, visual work. Um, so it's, it's really an honor to have uh, each of these writers here, and we're going to get to hear each of them read from their work and then have a conversation, uh, talk with, uh, with you a little bit, and, uh, and hopefully have a great night. Um, so uh, thanks so much for coming, and uh, I'll let Natanya come and introduce the first, uh, the first writer. Okay. Thank you. Thanks all for coming. Um, I think the themes will emerge in the course of our reading, and, uh, and then um, we're all looking forward very much to the discussion. I'm uh, very happy to introduce the first reader, my friend, Ruth Dannon, who is the author of three books of poetry, most recently, Word Has It, one chapbook, and a book of literary criticism. Her poetry and prose have appeared in many journals and anthologies, including Best American Poetry. She is completing a memoir about growing up on the grounds of the Binghamton State Hospital in New York with her mother, a Hungarian refugee who worked there as a psychiatrist. Ruth now lives in Beacon, New York with her two kittens and her husband, whose artwork was on the cover of her two last books, last two books, and teaches in the Hudson Valley and New York City. Ruth was born in Chicago and is excited about reading in the city of her birth. So, Ruth Dannon. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Camera, are you OK? Are you happy? OK. Um, thank you. First of all, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Ira, for introducing the evening. Thank you, Natanya, for inviting me and for introducing me. It's a pleasure to meet Dina and Faisal. And it's a real honor to read to you tonight. I'm going to do something sort of unusual, because I'm the opening act. 
And I thought it would be interesting to think about the transnational somewhat historically. So I'm going to read partly at Ira's suggestion, actually, from the memoir, which is not yet finished, parts of which have been published in Tupelo Quarterly. And I'm just going to read two little sections from it. Um, as, as Natanya said, I did grow up on the grounds of a mental hospital. So I'm going to begin with describing the arrival there. And then I'm going to dis, uh, read a section from a later part of the book in which I describe another crossing. There are a couple of things you need to know. You will, you will learn in the uh, course of my reading that Christmas was important. That's OK, because we really are a Jewish family. And it's important that you know that we're Jews who celebrated Christmas, just so you don't get confused. I uh, don't want you to be confused. Um, my grandmother, who's mentioned here, is named Frida, and my grandfather was named Adolf, and my mother was named Vera, and I'm Ruth. So this is from the beginning of a memoir which is called Mother and Child Reunion. When I was a child, I lived with my mother and grandmother in a large Victorian apartment on the second floor of the Broadmoor building. Broadmoor was one of the oldest buildings of the Binghamton State Hospital, which in the year we moved there, 1954, housed about 4,000 chronically and acutely ill mental patients. I was five when we moved to Broadmoor and 12 when we moved across the street into a small white cottage that had been transported from higher up on the hillside and which had once been the pest house, the place where patients with communicable diseases were kept in isolation. My mother was a doctor and a refugee. In those years, the hospitals were staffed largely by European doctors who came to the United States after the Second World War and found it difficult to enter the mainstream of the American medical profession. The Zajkowskis from Poland lived upstairs and across the street, the Bylos from the Ukraine. And over on Garden Avenue lived the Weisses from Germany by way of China and others whose names I don't remember. There were also some Americans always referred to in that way as the administrators the Americans ran the place. My mother was originally from Hungary, but she had traveled to Italy, to Spain, to Paraguay, to Argentina before she landed in the US and eventually in Binghamton. With her, a mother and daughter. Behind her, a failed marriage. My parents separated when I was nine months old. A dead child, two wars, and an abortive revolution. She wanted some respite from history, and reprieve from the vicissitudes of her own life. Given a choice between Central Islip, Long Island, and Binghamton, she chose upstate New York. We arrived in Binghamton in late summer, a time of year ripe with impending change. My father and his second wife had left the United States to live and work in Germany. I was about to start kindergarten, and my mother was starting a new job. My uncle Tommy, who had a car, drove us from where we had been living in Queens to Binghamton. It was a long trip through the Catskills on the old Route 17, a windy road that made fast travel impossible. By the time we arrived, it was dark. I had been sleeping soundly in the back seat of the car when suddenly the centrifugal force of the car, making a wide curving turn, pushed me into the right rear door and woke me up. I could feel the wide turn even though I couldn't see anything. The shift of weight in my body suggested we were no longer traveling forward, that we had made the sort of definitive gesture that announced arrival. Awake though I was and alert to the change, I pretended to sleep. The car came to a stop and I continued my imitation of sleep. I knew that if I was sleeping, I would be lifted in my uncle's arms, cradled, and then carried wherever we would go next. And so my uncle opened the car door and lifted my soon-to-be five-year-old body out of the car and up a set of wide wooden steps into the huge building that was Broadmoor, 
across a floor covered in black and white hexagonal tiles, up a flight of stairs, through one of the two green doors, into a hallway, then into a room where he placed me gently on a bed, where I did, in fact, fall back into a deep sleep, such that I woke up the next morning to weak sunlight and a view of the bars on the windows of one of Broadmoor's two giant wings. So now I'm going to read from a later section in the book describing another passage, another crossing. You need to know that my grandfather Adolf was a communist, although he came from a very well-to-do family, and he participated in a very short-lived revolution in Hungary in 1919, a revolution headed by a man called Béla Kuhn. And this is what happened. In 1919, two years after the Russian Revolution, the communists came to power in Hungary under the leadership of Béla Kuhn. My grandfather was asked by his government to go to Vienna to try to establish some kind of trade relations between the outlaw government and the rest of the world. This request gave my grandfather a chance to serve the revolution he had helped to instigate and a way to escape from Frida and the children, to shed responsibilities he found onerous and dull, and to distance him from a wife he found cold. In Vienna, the women were as delicate as the porcelain my grandmother disdained, and as charmed by Adolf as Frida was by her babies. Adolf liked women. The story was told that whenever he strayed too far, Frida would woo him back and they would conceive a child. Then, immersed in pregnancy and infants, Frida would withdraw, leaving Adolf to wander yet again. The pattern would repeat itself. After the fourth child, the second one named Michael, died, Frida became despondent. Only the birth of her youngest child revived her spirits at all. My grandfather went to Vienna on behalf of the regime, but it's not exactly clear what he did there. After the revolution failed, he was accused of embezzlement, but whether the charge is true, I cannot say. The revolution itself lasted only 132 days. One night in August 1919, there came a knock on Frida's door. It was Rakosi, then a young man full of political ambition and fevered with idealism. Later, he became known as one of Stalin's bloodiest loyalists, but then, on that evening in August, he was pale-faced, gentle, concerned about the young family. He told my grandmother that the revolution had collapsed. There, in the middle of the, her comfortable home, surrounded by the good she had ignored, with her frightened children clustered around her, my grandmother was told to leave the country immediately. Rakosi explained that two trains were leaving, waiting to leave Budapest the next day. One would go east to Moscow, another west to Vienna. My grandmother decided to go west. She loved her husband and was loyal to him. She also had an instinct for survival. The next day, the four children, my grandmother, and one trusted Marishka boarded a train for Vienna. Marishka is kind of a generic name for a nursemaid or a household helper, so they're all known as Marishka. All the linen, the china, the furniture, the rugs, the beautiful white dresses for dancing school, all the books and the toys that had been gathered over successive birthdays and Christmases, all were left behind. The trains left, one went east, one went west. Most of those who went to Moscow were later killed by Stalin or disappeared in the gulag. Those who went to Vienna survived, at least until Hitler. My grandmother, I'm skipping a little bit. My grandmother never talked about herself. It was hard to know what she was thinking or feeling. So inscrutable was her self-presentation. She kept her lips pursed tight or ventured sly smiles like a cat. What was she thinking as the train pulled out of Budapest? Did she know she was leaving Hungary for good? Did she know her marriage was approaching its unhappy denouement? Did she feel secretly glad for the crisis? Did she feel herself moving towards a place in history or away from one? My mother, age 10, concluded that her world was coming to an end. The other children were young enough not to register the loss quite so keenly, though they suffered it in other ways. Did the family talk on the train? <coughs> Did they cry? I do not know. Here is a story I do know. 
The family had left everything and everyone behind except for the Marishka, the nursemaid who was necessary because the youngest child, Tommy, was still in diapers. The Marishka, who had a name, Stephanie, was a young German-speaking woman. She might have been German or Austrian. In any case, she was not Hungarian. She was young, probably a peasant stock, and not in any way connected with the family's political activities. She agreed to accompany the family because she was devoted to the baby and to Frida. Maybe she also wanted to return to Austria. The train stopped at the border. Everyone was ordered out of the car so that the guards could check the papers and examine the luggage. This was a special train filled with family members of deposed and despised government. These were dangerous times. The political refugees had diplomatic papers, but Stephanie had no papers at all. It was a risky moment. The family did not want to lose her, and there was no guarantee that she would be safe if she were sent back to Hungary. Furthermore, if the family were caught trying to smuggle someone out of the country, it might jeopardize their own effort to escape the Horthy government. The guards checked and approved each person. Each one approved stepped across a space of a few feet onto Austrian soil. Frida handed the guard her papers and those of the children. Stephanie waited, holding the baby. The children were approved and each crossed over. Stephanie handed the baby to Frida. Frida was approved and she and the baby crossed over. Stephanie waited. My grandmother looked around, noticed that the guards were momentarily distracted. She reached out with one hand, grabbed Stephanie's arm, and yanked her across the border. They were on the Austrian side and safe. The guards never noticed. My mother was petrified, stunned at her mother's audacity. The family and Stephanie boarded the train and continued on to Vienna. So if you want to know more, you're going to have to wait till the book comes out. <laughs> um, that is Prelude. I'm going to read now a little bit from my new book, Word Has It. Word Has It deals with what I consider to be the terrible period of anxiety and foreboding that preceded our recent presidential election, the time during and after the election, uh, and I'm going to read a few poems from this book. Uh, the first section of the book is called Rumor Murmur, and it has to do with foreboding, and it begins on a train. I just ended on a train. I'm beginning on a train. Interruption. I attempt travel. I fail, missing the train or the boat, so to speak. These accidents prove lucky in some strange way forcing me into a few quiet moments, quiet enough to, for example, read a book and laugh out loud, thus breaking the silence and the mood that can only be described as foreboding. Change happens. Another train arrives late. I climb aboard. An act of faith in a simple time. Now, late in the season, I am inexplicably obsessed with spies. Anyone could turn up with a secret. Anyone could be someone else. It's why I sit outside at this cafe, twirling the stem of a wine glass, pretending to drink Pinot Noir. Alert to the sudden motion in the street, I raise my eyes. Now the firemen drift slowly down the avenue, carrying hatchets, bearing their own names across their backs, or so they say. Who's to say they haven't switched coats? Who's to say there's a fire? I just can't read my own pages here. This poem is a called Approach, and it was written before the so-called president established his travel ban. Approach. Close on to the longest night of the year, moon just past full, 
nothing to declare. I walk through customs, papers in one hand, luggage in the other. Gatekeepers nod. Gatekeepers never know what I carry, what I leave behind. Revelation, rival gangs of angels, oranges and lemons, crimson amaranth, time before trouble. This is the last section, last poem in the first section of the book. It's called The Gates. These poems are all very little, very little. The Gates. What's left of the past holds me, arches of ancient cities and the gifts of patrons and gods. The word lapis comes to mind, as well as fig and duty, as in that which must be paid. And I'm just going to read two more poems, and then I'll go away. Or at least I'll go sit down. Maybe I won't go away. This is a different kind of migration altogether. It's called a loft. They say the fingers were much longer than the thumbs and curved ever so slightly. This, they say, meant that these creatures, early versions of each, of us, excuse me, early versions of us, used those curved fingers to climb trees. But of course, after that, the journey was all downwards. And surely we know, don't we, though we never speak of it, that once we had beaks and claws, we had feathers and plumes, once we were birds and came flying out of the trees. And then I'm going to close with another family piece, but this time it's about my father's family, about which I know very little. I have a half-sister that was produced in Germany after my father and his second wife went there, and uh, this is for my sister. Uh, it's called A Family Story. My sister is enchanted by a homeless woman who paints birds. Together they wander Central Park, filling bird feeders, leaving trails of crumbs. My father, who is also my sister's father, spent the last year of his life almost homeless. That is to say, he lived like a homeless person in an apartment in Paris. But as it turns out, the apartment in Paris was one room filled with old newspapers, broken furniture, and food rotting on broken plates. You get the picture. After he died, my sister was the one to clean it up. Now when it gets cold or wet, the homeless woman who paints birds moves into my sister's one-room apartment. The homeless artist hangs her paintings on my sister's walls and pays for breakfast. She takes the dying cat to the vet. The birds, lately mostly owls, look on. Thank you very much. It is now, thank you, it is now my pleasure and honor to introduce our second reader, Dina Ellenbogen. She is the author of poetry collection, Apples of the Earth, and a memoir drawn from water an American poet, an Ethiopian family, an Israeli story. Her poetry, essays, and fiction have appeared in numerous magazines and anthologies, including Lit Hub, Tiferet, New City Chicago, and Woven Tale Press, and she has received the Jeff Marks Memorial Poetry Prize, the Anna Rosenberg Award from Poetica Magazine, and the Minam Lindbergh Israel Poetry for Peace Prize. She has completed a second poetry collection and a book of essays. She has an MFA in poetry from the Iowa Writers' Workshop and teaches creative writing at the University of Chicago Graham School. Please welcome Dina. here with all these papers.
Can you hear me? I'm a little shorter than that. Well, thank you, Ruth, for the introduction. And thank you so much, Guild Complex and Ira, for putting this together, and Natanya for gathering all of us poets together, and my fellow poets. And thanks to all of you for coming this evening. I'm going to begin by reading a few poems from Apples of the Earth. And as I was discussing with the other poets earlier, as I was thinking about this topic and looking you know, for which work I wanted to read this evening, I was struck by how so much of my work fits into this category. It was difficult to choose. And then I ended up choosing some really old poems to begin with that I haven't read for a long time. And um, so it's kind of fun to revisit them. And the first poem, um, like Ruth's poems, the first two poems that I'm going to be reading take place on a train. Rising for the Buddha, who falls onto the L with groceries for three generations, who escape pirates and prisons to arrive in a place where a man sees clotheslines of a different poverty pass through a train window who with wrinkles of 60 monsoons lets a woman rise from her seat for him to replace her. His fists are full with green onions from the large gardens of a strange America he takes home to a table where everything and nothing wait for him. The next poem that I'm going to read is called Trains, and it's in five short sections. I'm going to read four of those sections. And this poem is, really serves as a kind of introduction to my work. It begins with family history and um, moves into my relationship with Israel a little bit. And it's probably, it's one of the oldest poems in the collection. One, the first were childhood, trains we made with chairs when my mother lined them up in the hallway, cardboard trains in the doctor's office, trains that led to Chicago, when the train came up for air among buildings, we would stare into other people's windows. I wanted to climb those rickety Chicago porches with yellowing geraniums on the sill and always a cat perched on the ledge where a window was missing. When the train went below ground, I remembered the red skin of my next door neighbor dying of leukemia and President Kennedy on TV in a striped box, my parents weeping soundlessly. Two, in the city, it was the stone lions in front of the art museum who called to us. In the gift shop, I asked my mother for a train set like my cousin had. She bought me marionettes. On State Street, I fell in love with a pink clock in the window of Shapiro's jewelers. On the train, on the way home, my mother flipped the clock over to find its origins. Germany, I promised not to tell. Three, for weeks the pink clock ticked with the rhythm of trains shined like a forbidden apple. When my father saw the name on the clock, he said nothing, but his anger lived in the walls he painted and the fences he built around our house. My father's anger was red. When he bathed, he drowned in it. He wore his anger in his clothes. When he laughed, it waited on his tongue. When he lay down, it rose above his head. My father did not sleep. Those mornings I walked with red boots, burning patches in the snow. At night, I'd lie awake to the sound of train whistles like worn kettles and my father's ceiling windows so the rain would not enter, so the air would not escape. And skipping over to section five. Years later, from Haifa to Tel Aviv, I sat on a train near a soldier who dreamed out loud of a father who fell against a barbed wire fence. Ariel dreamed even in his waking, he said, outside of this land, we have nothing but enemies. Later, we walked through Tzfat, artist's colony, birthplace of Kabbalah. I ran my fingers through rugs from Akko, dresses from Brazil. I stood listening to the ticking of the beautiful German clocks until the sun set and everything closed around, around us. We climbed above Tzfat where trains didn't pass. I tried to photograph the shadows the sun left in the sky until Hasidic boys invaded us like hawks with beards and kippot on their heads. They threw stones at our backs. Ariel whispered, 
They don't like cameras on the Sabbath. When they left, talking was difficult, so we gathered stones like the mystics on their knees gathering sparks. Ariel threw them at the sky. I threw them down the mountain where I knew trains would always pass. Holy cities. This is not Jerusalem, but the avenue of the Americas where my bag is searched on the way in and out of the public library, the one where lions sit on Fifth Avenue, just north or south of 42nd. And it is not Jerusalem, but Chicago, where I remove my boots with metal zippers, where my young son takes off his hush puppies and runs through detectors in this land of the brave and the free. In the sky between two American cities, my daughter asks if I'm afraid when our plane hits clouds. I say no, swallow terror deeper than sky. My daughter was born at the end of the millennium and she questions always the beginnings of things. My son was born at the beginning of the century and words come to him slowly. Before he learned plain, he saw a sky change, saw a day in America where nothing rose up and nothing landed, where birds announced the day. Is there a place in this poem to utter something as unfathomable as a plane into buildings? It drags the line, buildings, planes, poems, beginnings, life, endings, a generation that speaks slowly, carries big sticks. We bow down, remove our shoes, open our bags, where every city has become holy. I'm going to move on to prose for a few minutes, and I'm going to be reading from my memoir, Drawn from Water. And I'm going to read a, an, a section that takes place sort of in the middle of a 25-year journey um, in and out of Israel, studying the lives of Ethiopian Jews. And I had lived there during Operation Moses in 1985 and became very close to some children who I watched over a 25-year period, sort of watched them grow up in Israel and through them tried to determine if Israel had really become home or not to this group of immigrants. And um, this section takes place in July 1998. I carry my daughter through Jerusalem streets. She is asleep on my shoulder. I think of ways to explain why I've taken her to this Middle Eastern country where everything, including time, has been turned upside down. This hot and holy city where she is light against me, where I push her through stone streets in her blue stroller with American wheels, where she stands up for the first time, weeps next to the wall, and where in the men's section, her father names her Serena Bat Yisrael. Serena, daughter of Israel. I've come to finish the story that is always ending and beginning again. I've come to close the book that is never sealed. I've come to walk these streets with Steve, my husband of two years, and our eight-month-old daughter. I've come to see my friends who 14 years ago arrived here from Ethiopia. I've come to see Oznot, my former student, in her home next to the sea, to watch as she and Serena look into each other's eyes for the first time. I've come to see Alad, Bacha, and their family that is growing and spreading throughout the country, but always returning to the hearth in Kfar Saba. I've come to see Yael, who has been wrapped in secrets these past two years. I've come to hear the story of her mother, who has just arrived in Israel. I've come to walk through the caravans where Falash Mora, whose compound has just been emptied in Addis Ababa, are beginning new lives. And the Falash Mora are um, Ethiopians whose origins are Jewish, but they converted to Christianity along the way and are now trying to come back to Judaism. I've come to see what, if anything, has been learned from the past. I've come again to understand absorption, how a land absorbs a people, how a people absorb a land and then find a way to return to themselves. And then I'm going to just read a short section from um, a little bit later. And this is when, you know, I had lived there in 1985, and my first return trip was 1989, um, where I came back to see how these children were doing five years after Operation Moses. And 
when I had lived there, I'd really be, felt like I was part of the family, part of the community, and when I came back all these years later, I had six weeks, a deadline, and I needed to find an answer. And so I felt more like an anthropologist. So this was um, that transformation. I feel lost because without language, I have no map. I had always understood the world through texts. When I asked my mother difficult questions, she handed me books. When I first wanted to know Israel, find an entree into her landscape, I proposed to translate the lesser known Israeli poets into English. I wanted to crack open the secret language to listen to the whispers of the poets in order to discover the essence of Israel. But as Amachai, the wisest of the poets, had instructed me, I was not coming to Israel to explore her libraries, and it would take years, if not a lifetime, to gain the intimacy with Hebrew I'd need to translate the Israeli poets. The Ethiopian Jews, by a twist of fate, have become my next enigma. They are my text, their wide eyes, sealed lips, the rhythms of their Hebrew, the distant echo of their footsteps trekking through Sudan. I'm still not sure what I need to translate this text. Hebrew is only one of the tools. And what would knowing their lives tell me? I had asked Oznot in the poem I wrote to her, has the dream come true? Can you write in three languages? If their dream comes true, I can believe in the purpose of Israel, not to swallow her immigrants, but to truly say to them, welcome home. In my mission to discover if the Ethiopian Jews have really come home to Israel, language is getting in the way. Once I was their teacher, friend, and comrade. In America, I did not stop dreaming of the children. I never forgot the shy smiles of the Ethiopian women in white shamas, deep green scarves, babies on their backs. I did not forget these women who were unable to use the language that their children were just starting to master. Now I walk among them with a blank notebook and a thick black pen, and I'm armed with questions, so many questions. I'm becoming the anthropologist that Jackie and I talked about on her porch. Instead of absorbing their lives into my own, I'm watching again through a window. I'm not speaking their language of silence, but I'm giving straight and difficult questions to a private and gentle people who speak their most important truths in parables but I am on a mission and I have six weeks to find an answer. And I am relieved, I think, that sometimes my question shifts. I no longer constantly ask, is Israel my home? Should I have made Aliyah? Can I live here now? Instead, when I speak to my Ethiopian friends, all of my questions, large and small, can be translated into one simple one. Has Israel become your home? Now I'm gonna read just a few poems from a new manuscript, which is called Most of What is Beautiful. And um, this first poem is really written about an experience that my son had when he stayed at a church on the border of Texas and Mexico with his youth group to study immigration. It's called They Took Your Apples at the Border. You had carried them from Texas to Mexico and back in a pack so small and green, most eyes didn't suspect you, had come to the border to listen. Let your kids sink in desert sands like whispered stories of those who reach for the doors of sanctuary. At 15, you let them in, share a stove, fill plates and beans, fill plates with beans and rice before the silence rises with the next knock at the midnight door. These next two poems were written um, when I left Israel in 2014, um, right as the Gaza, the Second Gaza War was breaking out. Um, and it was called Operation Protective Edge. The poem is called Protective Edge. You stop in the middle of your letter for sirens, not rockets. There is a dome over Jerusalem, but sirens that break sentences in half make a language out of silence. You ask forgiveness for your broken thought. Your words fade into my night or your morning I can still taste from last month. Cold coffee, hot sun on my shoulders as I drove away from the first falling sounds of war. As I was recently discussing with a friend what poetry is, um, I was talking about how one of the wonderful things about this genre is that in some ways it allows you to be 
in many different places at once in the past and in the present um, in one country or the other or in between two countries. And when I returned from Israel, I was witnessing difficult things happening in um, my town of Evanston and I was still trying to comprehend a lot of the horrible things that had happened in Israel when I had been there and um, somehow was able to bring them together in this poem, which is called Missing. Blame it on the brutal winter, tomatoes still not ripe enough to pick, her mother at work all day, sometimes missing until midnight. Now she's gone missing, 15 black, last seen on her bike, no helmet, waiting to go anywhere except where she went, missing. I miss you these days. You've missed the point of our silence, the place where river turns to lake. Three boys missing in the West Bank were found. We were right there gathering seed daffodils when cell phones rang with the news. The country knew weeks before they announced that they were no longer missing but dead, white, 15, 15, and 17. I miss when I could speak in black and white, when words weren't so often missing. An Israeli soldier missing in action is dead inside his helmet. What's missing from the story is whether he had been captured first, then killed by his own ammunition. I miss when I could speak into your ear instead of dancing over the missing spaces the way that poems do. The missing girl's face is on the tunnel below the tracks where I run before sunrise. She has been found now on the south side of the city What's missing is how she got there. She is safe in the water's edge where I keep running as calm. What I miss most is swimming out to the deep center, which is too cold this summer. Blame it on last winter, the missing sea glass, the war that runs through us like wild rivers, even when we are missing. And I'm going to end with a um, hopefully more upbeat poem called um, Garden of Everlasting Happiness. They say the garden of everlasting happiness should only be looked at from across the water. There are no bridges to take us through shadows of untouched earth. Bonsai trees squat this August, so finely sculpted they protect the view. If once we were brave swimmers, today we are waders. Under uncertain skies, planes take refugees from hostile terrain to sanctuary. Once we saw the Statue of Liberty from across water, we didn't touch her outstretched arm, yet it looms above our days. Didn't they say the garden of everlasting happiness is just across the shallow water? We keep reaching from the other side while brave geese skirt the water and land there. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce um, Fasil Mohayudin. He is the author of the poetry collection, The Displaced Children of Displaced Children, which was winner of the 2017 Sexton Prize for Poetry and a 2018 summer recommendation of the Poetry Book Society. He is also the author of the chapbook, The Riddle of Longing. His poetry, prose, and visual art have appeared in many magazines and journals, and he has received the Edward Stanley Award from Prairie Schooner and the Gwendolyn Brooks Poetry Prize. He serves as an educator advisor to the global not-for-profit Narrative 4 and teaches English at Highland Park High School in suburban Chicago. Vassal. Thank you, Dina. Thank you very much. Um, Ira and Andrea from a distance and the Chopin Theater and the Guild Literary Comp Complex, thank you for having us. Natanya, thanks for putting this together. And Adina, thank you for the introduction and the friendship. And Ruth, we, we're just meeting for the first time and I'm really happy and thank you all for being here. I'm going to read three poems. Uh, the first one is a guzzle and it, it, um, the title of the book comes from the guzzle. So a guzzle is written in couplets and the last word of each couplet is the same. And it, the idea of missing it kind of made me think of a guzzle. And it's called Guzzle for the Diaspora. The next poem will be a longer one, and then I'll end with a very, very short piece. Guzzle for the Diaspora. 
We have always been the displaced children of displaced children. Tethered by distant rivers to abandoned lands, our blood's history lost. To temper the grief, imagine your father's last breath as a mogul garden. Marble pool at its center, the mirrored sky holding all his tribe had lost. Above the tussle of his wounded city, sad-eyed paper kites fight to stay aloft. One lucky child will be crowned the winner. Everyone else will have lost. Wish peace upon every stranger who arrives at your door, even the thief. For you never know when your last chance at redemption will be lost. In another version of the story, a steady loneliness mothers away the rust. Yet without windows in its hull, the time traveler's supplication gets lost. Against flame-lipped testimonies of exile's erasures, the swinging of an ax, felled bunion trees populate your nightmares, new enlightenments lost. The rim of this porcelain cup is chipped, so sip with practiced caution. Even a trace of blood will copper the flavor, the respite of tea now lost. Tell me, Fassel, with what new surrender can you evade deeper damnation? Whatever it is, hack away before your children too become the lost. So my uh, family immigrated to the United States from Pakistan in the 1970s. And um, in 1947, it was the partitioning of India and uh, Pakistan and uh, West and East, which became uh, Bangladesh. And so a lot of, the, a lot of um, the poems are inspired by that migration and the fact that no one in my family talked about it. And so that poem um, talks about that. Uh, there are other poems that deal with displacement and exile. Uh, and this is, a lo this is the longest poem in the book, and it's called Denaturalization. And it's a, a historical poem about, and so the full title is Denaturalization, an elegy for Mr. Vaishno Das Bagai, an American. And so this is about an uh, in, uh, immigrant from India who, at the time, um, if you were Indian, your race was considered white and your complexion was a dark. Uh, and because you were white, you could become a naturalized citizen in the US. And uh, so he immigrated, he had money, he started a business, became very successful. And um, at some point, um, not at some point, but there was a lot of anti-Asian sentiment in California. He was in San Francisco. And um, there was a, a famous Supreme Court case called United States versus Bhagat Singh Tind, uh, 1923. And in that case, there was a Sikh man named Bhagat Singh Tind who had become a naturalized citizen. His wife was you know, white American uh, of European descent, American born. He was a veteran of the US Army um, in World War I. And his citizenship was challenged. Uh, I, don't, I don't know all the circumstances. So it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And they ruled and said, you are not white, um, despite. Um, and the, the, the reason they gave is that white is only white if people who are white and seen as white by others who are white see you as white. And because you are dark skinned, you can't be white, and so he was denaturalized, and anyone else um, who was of Indian descent and became a citizen had their citizenship stripped. And so to, to become a citizen, you have to sever ties to your previous country, which is Great Britain. And so a ton of people became nationless. And so Vaishno Dasbagai, um, he was so distraught over this and um, that he ended up committing suicide uh, a few years later, and before he killed himself, he wrote a letter to his wife, his three sons, and he wrote an op-ed to the uh, San Francisco Examiner, and they published it. And so I, read, I remember reading this person's story, and I was like, I, I would love to write about this person at some point. So I'm gonna, the epigraph in the poem is from March 17, 1928, and it's uh, taken from his uh, Bagai's suicide letter. And it says, now what am I, what have I made of myself and my children? We cannot exercise our rights, humility and insults, who is responsible for all this? Me and the American government. Obstacles this way, blockades that way, 
and bridges burnt behind. It's written in eight sections. Each section has a title, and they're in multiple and different voices. And one, the section that's the Supreme Court one, I'll just say this now, is the, the second half of the poem is, is directly lifted from the, the, the decision um, in, in the Chief Justice's words. And so, one, inner light. As a boy, visiting blood in the warmer regions of Hindustan, bursting with a sorrow he did not yet understand. He stuffed his mouth with a mouth, with a fire of fireflies, haunting his bemused cousins with a flickering smile, all teeth and flint spark. Before they drowned in the spit of unspoken wishes, he gulped them down, believing, thanks to the delicious God-bending buck-buck of his best friend, Muhammad, a princely Pathan, eyes bewitched by a marrow deep lust for independence, that the swallowed magic of their light would guide his ache shackled heart toward a purer promise of home waiting beyond the untouchable hunger of this stolen land's stolen futures in a place perfected by freedom and christened America to San Francisco. For 13 years he woke, haunted by the dreamt of smells of Peshawar, that's the city where he was born. His father's neem fragrant breath, his mother's hair, its coconut oil pungent blooming comfort, the punch of gardenia ghosting through night's fragile stillness. Sometimes even the kneeling crave of sun-baked water buffalo dung burning beneath an immense copper egg of mung dal, enough to feed every hunger-striking prisoner back home or to last until the first blare of Judgment Day's trumpet call, until the bladed shards of a shattered American sky smashed against his brown face. His wife, Gala, their three sons, had allowed Bagai to forsake Brahma, he was Hindu, to turn his faith toward the blue-eyed gods of transformation, who had greeted them at the gates of Angel Island with flameless lanterns, lanterns, festering wounds to mark the sights of amputated wings. Kala had given in to the delusion too, had out of mercy learned to bite her, t her cautioning tongue, to silence doubt, to sweet talk away the undeniable, that one day her husband's blood would mount the most vicious testimony against him. Three, the Chinese. Some of the ones loitering in the streets of California look to me like dirty catfish. Perhaps that is why the Goras, the whites, are so afraid they carry a taint pursed behind slashed eyes. The first time I met one, a nomadic herbalist en route to Kabul, where he'd met a girl two years before who was waiting his return, he asked me, mouthing each labored word of English as if spitting out a clod of cold earth, if I had a spare shilling to purchase for him a few sips of salvation. As he drank water from a bisti spout, water I paid for, not out of kindness, but a towering gut swell of pity, he promised he'd return to Peshawar, he and his bride-to-be, and pay back his debt in gift. These days, whenever one of them spits at my wife's feet for wearing her sari in public, or daring to flaunt the nose diamond with the audacity of the newly emancipated, I touch the heavenly silk flower hidden in my pocket to remember the strange beauty of that man's spirit and the quiet might I held in the smiling incandescence of his wife's face round as the moon. Then I drown in long swigs of silence to vanquish the rage and despair embering within the throats of my fellow American-souled Asiatics 
as we battle the ugly self-annihilation prowling in every mirror, hungry, ready to pounce, to devour our, heart, devour our hearts from the inside out. Four, United States versus Bhagat Singh, Tind, 1923. <clears throat> Mr. Justice Sutherland, white America requests you, an immigrant from Great Britain, but now a naturalized citizen of these great United States of America, to please, if you may, answer with an absence of smirk. The unflinching angels of history are watching us, your honor, the following two questions. One, is a high caste Hindu of full Indian blood born in Amritsar, Punjab, India, a white person? Two, does the Immigration Act of February 5th, 1917 disqualify from naturalization as citizens those Hindus now barred by that act who had lawfully entered the United States prior to the passage of said act? And this is the Chief Justice. It may be true that the blonde Scandinavian and the brown Hindu have a common ancestor in the dim reaches of antiquity, but the average man knows perfectly well that there are unmistakable and profound differences between them today. It is a matter of familiar observation and knowledge that the physical group characteristics of the Hindus render, render them readily distinguishable from the various groups of persons in this country commonly recognized as white. The children of English, French, German, Italian, Scandinavian, and other European parentage quickly merge into the mass of our population and lose the distinctive hallmarks of their European origins. On the other hand, it cannot be doubted that the children born in this country of Hindu parents would re retain indefinitely the clear evidence of their ancestry. It is very far from our thought to suggest the slightest question of racial superiority or inferiority. What we suggest is merely racial difference. And it is of such character and extent that the great body of our people instinctively recognize it and reject the thought of assimilation. Five, uh, denaturalization. Sometimes they revert to trickery, apple their venom with a smile, hide serpent tongues behind cages of teeth. Bagai understood banishment, the fall from perfumed air by imagined dignity. His lungs blackened by the scorch of bridges burnt. The British ruined him long before America got its chance to, but blindness costs nothing. Not when tomorrow holds out two hands, one to cloak each eye. So one morning, in the familiar chokehold of his office on Fillmore, as Bagai stood half dead already in a diminish diminishing island of sunlight, once again fighting off the demons of a home facing nostalgia, a pudgy, ruddy-cheeked ruddy associate, Adams, born of Adams and before him another such Adams, all the way back to Adam himself, blew open Bagai's heart with a newspaper, carefully folded to display a weaponized headline. Adam's finger stabbed the words and spoke in the desert lilt of Eastern California of the lunacy of Bagai's people. Such blasphemy, Adams said launching into a lurching diatribe about this turbaned Hindu who, with the tenacity only a crazy man could muster, claimed whiteness against the shouting protests of his dark skin, against the thickening tangle of the nation's self-cleansing combustibility. Adams, appalled and apple-eyed, lost himself in wobbling laughter. Bagai seized the newspaper, retreated to the window, and felt his skin begin to dissolve, while down below a knot of Chinese laborers shared a pipe, inhaling deeply the white smoke, their longing unbuttoned from home-starved souls by opium's hushed mercy. 
Bagai continued to read, this Hindu, Tind, was in fact a Sikh, a veteran of the US Army, a lover of Whitman, Emerson, Thoreau, a Caucasian on account of his Punjabi birth, made and unmade a citizen, had been shoved by the courts into a sacrificial spotlight, becoming the, natural, the national face of denaturalization, a goat placed throat up beneath the butcher. Adams, son of Adams, snatched back the paper, narrowed the dead blue of his eyes into knives, spoke now of the limits of desire, a touch too gleefully for Bagai's withering sense of pride. Or perhaps Adams' pluckiness was another trick Bagai had fallen for, his heart-rending want so deep it had become accustomed to recasting every tongue slap of poison into song. And when his Berkeley neighbors shuttered the doors of his newly mortgaged Eden-to-be, he understood Adam's warning, understood exactly what even the Supreme Court of this nation found so untouchable about his kind. The blindfold had unraveled. He did not pick up a chisel to loosen the planks, nor attempt to, to diffuse hate by showcasing the bonafide radiance of his sweet salesman smile. Instead, he swallowed another defeat, felt his soul turn slowly toward his now dead childhood friend, Muhammad, and began within the gathering darkness of despair to script a reunion. Bagai penned in by shadows glared at the newspaper Adams had left behind and saw the truth, that despite whatever bargain he tried to strike with the devil, he had never been and would never be an American. He was different, and his displacement was different, hovering along the blade edge of grief, banished on account of his unchangeable blood. I'm going to six, skip number six. That's uh, and go to seven. This is the where he actually commits suicide, which he calls uh, a moral gesture. And so, as his soul migrates from the earthy depths of his broken body into the white noise of death. Behind him, an echo of light, a scarlet tanager perched at a window beyond his sphere of vision. Wings so blooded with fire, their departure, a dread flash on the wall, and he evaporates into the life-affirming lure of poison-rich air. And the last section, restoration. <clears throat> Then the voice, Muhammad's long ago silenced by bullet, lifting from the smoke, brother welcome home to despair, to the power held within it. Let's surrender to the perfected beauty of our inner light, converge as cloud enshrouding the shoulders of the holy mountains of our youth, become the sweetness of rain, the enduring innocence of silk flowers, let the atoms of our exiled existences mingle again in the ether beneath the burning gaze of the Almighty, into whose lovely mouth we may still return. Our souls, like the fireflies that filled our bellies as boys, their swallowed light convincing us as we took our last breath as brave men that rivers of pain had purified our longing given our bloodlines an undeniable claim upon whatever nation or delusion to which they wedded their perishable orbits, for which they sacrificed their innate holiness, all for a taste of might. And the last poem is called Migration Narrative, and um, I'll just say it's, it's about refugees. So it's a, sh a small, short poem, Migration Narrative. What wilts becomes the world for the wary. They can't help but wonder at the lovely shadow touch of another war's rubbled song. If crossing freely into fire can churn the blood's hollow music, then surely the orphan can ask at dusk for water and get more than spit. Thank you. <clears throat> So
So I have the pleasure of uh, introducing Natanya Rosenfeld, who you heard from a, f a little while ago. Uh, Natanya is the author of a scholarly monograph. She's also the, the person who made this happen, so uh, that should be part of your bio. Outsiders Together, Virginia and Leonard Wolf, and several articles on literary modernism, as well as a book of poetry, Wild Domestic, and a recent e-chat book, She and I, Essays. You can get the link back there, both, and the book back there. Her writing has appeared in many literary magazines, and four of her essays have been listed as notable and best American essays. She has completed a new collection of personal essays on art and identity, and is at work on a novel about hidden Jews in Poland during World War II, a book of essays on female Jewish artists, and a second book of poems. Natanya. Uh, I will read two poems from my book of poems, Wild Domestic, that um, are, they're very different, the two poems, but they have in common the theme of displacement. And um, I, I found myself thinking about this poem in particular while I listened to the others reading. It's a poem called Stranger. Uh, it's uh, fairly short and simple. Stranger. Encaged, feet steeped, Head bowed, beak grazing water's surface, I stood hours and days. Every so often they fed me something hard, pushing it into the slit of my mouth. I swallowed without lifting or turning my head, without shifting body or feet. When they came to check on me, the water I stood in was thick red. Just a bird, they said, a hawk from somewhere else. We didn't put her there. And the next poem, um, I, I, I'm lucky enough to have inherited a, a pretty classic immigration, American immigration story from my grandmother. This is called All She Remembered, and it's in the voice of Bertha Rosenfeld, who was born in 1904 and died in 1991. Look, this is all I can tell you. I was sick the whole time on the boat, I didn't know where I was going. My father was a man in a picture, first with a beard, then later without. His face didn't tell me anything about him or about my new mother and two strange sisters. I was 17. I made two friends on the way, but we parted, and I never heard from them. I think one went to Wyoming. Imagine Wyoming. Some people kept kosher on the ship and arrived skin and bone. I never cared enough to sacrifice my health. To be honest, my belief is not deep. I know if we honor his commandments, God is supposed to care for us, but I always believed what I could see. The first night on Ellis Island, I dreamed of my mother. You know that she died giving birth to me. I never saw her or heard her voice singing. That night, she came to me. She wore a long white dress, and her red hair shone down to her waist, the way young women wore their hair until they married and had to shave it off or cover it. She said to me, in Yiddish, of course, Tochter, it will be all right. So I believed her. What choice did I have? Either it would be all right, or it wouldn't. Better to believe it would. May she rest in peace. The Statue of Liberty I don't remember. I know my friends tried to make me look when we were coming into port, but I could only worry about what lay ahead. I'd traveled across Russia. It was a bad time, a dangerous time, a girl by herself to the port in Riga, and I wasn't afraid. But all I remember from my arrival is fear. And I'm going to read an essay, which comes from the eChap book. Um, and I, I hope people will want to read um, this essay again, maybe. And, and the, other, the other five essays that are in that eChap book, there's a leaflet at the back of the room. Please take it home. It's a free download. The chat book is called She and I. And uh, this, this essay is about, uh, it's about um, Berlin. And in a way, it's about Egypt. and. Um, I grew up the daughter of two uh, professors of German. We spent a certain amount of time in Germany in my childhood. I've been back to Berlin in recent years. Um, 
I feel there's something else I need to be telling you about in advance, but um, I think not. I think everything will explain itself in, in due, due course. Um, I'll just say that I was a bit younger when I wrote this piece than I am now. Nefertiti and the Hammam, or the Company of Women. And the epigraph is from the end of Mrs. Vir Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, for there she was. I've been waiting to meet her for most of the 40 plus decades, sorry, four plus decades of my life. I'm not that old, <laughs> okay, let's start again. I have been waiting to meet her for most of the four plus decades of my life, and in a darkened room in the museum in Berlin, I do so at last. It was my mother who first told me about her. She's the most beautiful woman in the world, or it's the most beautiful sculpture I have ever seen anywhere. From her periodic forays to visit friends in Berlin and escape our confining Midwestern small town, my mother brought back postcards of the Egyptian royal consort and hung them in her study. They may have helped inspire her to finish the dissertation that was broken off with her pregnancy and which she had to complete in order to be given the same salary her PhD less male colleagues were receiving. Under Klimt's Judith and Tutmose's Nefertiti, smoking pack after pack of Kent's, she finally made it. The minute I encounter her, I feel as though she knows me. Perhaps because, like Walter Pater's Mona Lisa, she has been a diver in deep seas and comprehended all things already. She knew me before I existed. I suspect, however, that I don't interest her in the least, nor do I feel she can see me, even though, unlike Rilke's faceless, armless, legless bust of Apollo, she has eyes. And I feel small in awe, as you do in the presence of a mountain or a roaring ocean. Nefertiti doesn't say to me what Apollo does in Rilke's poem, you must change your life. Although she is imperious, her presence is not about imperatives. And yet, like a force of nature, she appears to commune with the eternal, even as her focus is deeply inward. I feel decidedly that this person was not one to dispense her energies freely, but rather to keep them for what she knew mattered. This deserves my attention. That, on the other hand, is paltry. Also, that she had an ironclad sense of priorities, of hierarchies, although she was not of aristocratic blood and thus married upward and in a sense outward. I imagine her affectionate with her children but impatient with foolishness almost certainly indulgent toward her husband as toward no one else. I picture conversations at bedtime, serious counsel, his head on her chest before they sleep, fingers interlaced, or his hand just resting on her small breast like a bird on its egg, his austere face with the pendulous lip, the sharp elongated chin, discussion of decisions to be made the next day, agreement on the rationality and wisdom of henotheism, the sun is God, who could doubt that? How to convince the populace? How to raise six daughters who will be wise and find good husbands? I stand before her image like a daughter or a yearning sister. Down a long hallway with rooms on either side, her gaze meets that of the Gre Greco-Roman sun god Helios. He is all male muscle to her high-cheekboned, delicate intelligence. In the encounter between Rome and Egypt, Something fertile and rich is defeated. I decide to skip the Romans, to keep her torch burning in my breast. I do not want, here in the museum in Berlin, to think of empire, Caesar, pomp, and power. I do not want to think too much about the city's past. That night, tumbling down the corridor of sleep, I hear and see her vividly. She is disagreeing with a court physician over an unguent or drug to be administered to one of her daughters. I remember that one of the six died and was elaborately mourned. In my dream, I take Nefertiti's part and am at the same time the unfortunate physician, sure of his own knowledge, but afraid to resist imperial orders. What does she want from me? What do I want from her? On the second visit, I begin my approach underneath Helios. He is clearly a prototype for Michelangelo's David, but how vapid by comparison. The gaze beneath his brows is one of a stupid man trying to look intelligent. I don't like the angle or his expression. 
I proceed down the corridor, unable to discern her, until I have passed through many rooms of papyri and urns. A small, silent crowd in headphones surrounds her like a group of acolytes at a priestess's feet. I study her face, head, and neck until I feel I have memorized all its details. The chin with its two prominent bones, one on either side, that give her a slightly masculine look. The groove between nose and mouth so finely downturned. The lines of concern that frame her full but fine lips, contradicted by the very slight upturn that suggests she is about to smile. Is it something that the sculptor has just said? The repose of her face and the hint of humor in it suggest they were comfortable in one another's company, the empress and the artist. The slender, long neck that leans forward, its two tendons prominent, as if the headdress were almost too heavy to sustain. The headdress itself extending her head to double its height. The pale temples, as if the hair had been pulled from them to rest beneath the headdress. The perfectly curved eyebrows and eyes outlined in black, with their elusive expression, a tiny bit sardonic? The delicate, slightly flared nose, the achingly sharp line of the jaw. Agents would compete to, agencies would compete to make her a supermodel if she lived today. Thank goodness she doesn't. The difference between the face from the front and in profile. She is less severe, more feminine, and even more beautiful in profile. Few noses could compete with hers for proportion and fineness. Her name means the beautiful one is come, and indeed one has the sense of being privileged by a sudden arrival, an apotheosis. She is at one and the same time eternal and fleeting. At any moment she may disappear, lifted through the roof and into the heavens by invisible threads. Behave in her presence. Mother has a headache today, I can imagine Achnaten telling the children, for if her headgear and jewelry weren't sometimes too much for her, her thoughts must have been. And if the kids made noise, she disappeared through a door with the barest rustle of translucent fabric, leaving her daughters longing as I long. The long neck, her elusive gaze, the embodiment of longing. On neither visit do I notice that one eye is unpainted, left entirely white. Why don't I observe this? Have I unconsciously filled in the missing eye, unable to bear that someone so beautiful could be marred? Do I feel the need to protect her, as though she were a, chi she were a child and I the ancient mother? Apotheosis, those Greeks with their Zeus always coming down to penetrate some unwitting female mortal. Did they have no idea about the loves of women? In my dream later that day, I have a fever, am lying on the sofa. She embraces me, I embrace her. My hands are lost in her fluted white shift. My cheek rubs her smooth brown face. Then she disappears down a long hallway, arm in arm with Akhnaten, no longer my lover, but my parent, always ahead of me, always farther down the darkened hall. Or she is myself and my husband is Akhnaten, the intellectual, the iconoclast, my equal, our fingers intertwined like theirs. In the long nights, her delta was the Niles, and he immersed himself and was reborn. If she is weary with one eye elsewhere, it is because she gave of herself as deeply as a river, as deeply as a river she still gives to gaping viewers. I leave her and follow my nose through other parts of the museum. In a dreamy state, I take in some images acutely, others hardly at all. I find my way to various bas-reliefs, Greco-Roman ones in which naked male soldiers are fighting nude or semi-clothed Amazons, and Egyptian ones in which men slaughter oxen. In the latter, the men all assume similar, stereotyped positions, their feet high-arched, legs long and slender with muscular thighs, bending over the creatures with knives, while the bound beasts are differently presented, some with their slender legs in impossible configurations one on his back with his tail curling sinuously away from the neat round hole of his anus, so beautiful and so vulnerable to the men's weapons. Leaving the museum, I notice the huge statues flanking the stairs to the Altus Museum. On one side, a naked man on a horse that rears upward from a lion the man is spearing. On the other, a woman rider trying to spear a lion that has leapt onto her horse and is clinging toad-like to the equine chest and neck, ready to sink its teeth into flesh. 
man dominant, woman nearly defeated but still dominant, horse, the unfortunate domestic beast in the middle, and then truly wild animal, to be defeated in proof of the glory of man. The horse's lips pull back from its teeth in an agony of fear and anger. My petite, lovely friend Nadia comes to visit from London. We spend a lot of time lying in the grass of parks, talking. I have no strength, but her talk and her features and long hair, like those of a heroine in one of the 19th century novels she studies, where the beautiful Jewess converts for her Gentile lover, refresh me. During her visit, I'm diagnosed with anemia and hypothyroidism and finally know what's been wrong with me. We take a curative day apart from husbands and small boys with an afternoon at the Women's Hammam in Kreuzberg. The bath complex contains several different spaces and services, and after we've lain on the heated octagonal tile platform in the center of the actual hammam, itself an octagon with a domed mosaic ceiling and a skylight, Nadia goes for a massage, and I go to be peeled and scrubbed by a strapping middle-aged woman with a smoker's cough and Turkish disco playing in her wet room. While I lie on a raised slab, she sluices me with buckets of warm water, then scrubs and massages me in special liquid soap with a harsh mitten all over my body. I'm at once a baby being bathed and a lover caressed. The watery soap smells like flowers and feels amniotic, slippery. Is it good? asks my attendant, and I hum and moan. She shows me the gray caterpillars of dead skin she's raised all over my body. My limbs are white and translucent. I am cleansed and sybaritic. For a while, I enter the sauna where I sit alone until I can't stand it anymore. I take a quick, cool shower and go back to the magic room to lie on the tiles. While I wait for Nadia's return from the masseuse, I get talking to a young black woman with a slender body like a willow leaf here in Berlin on a study program for the summer. We agree on the progressive atmosphere of contemporary Berlin. I half watch two women, lovers seemingly, who sit beside one of the eight copper basins along the wall and scrub one another's backs and feet with the same rough mitt my washer used. Three English women enter, one of them massively fat, and lie down with me on the dais, settling in, chatting. I'm fascinated by the fat one's body and indeed by all the bodies I see around me. It feels natural to be naked among other naked women. There is no exhibitionist American gym atmosphere here, nor is this like one of those hokey spas with pseudo-Japanese motifs and piped-in flute music. I go upstairs in a little towel to buy a Turkish yogurt drink and sit for a while in a cooler room sipping it, thinking about the oppressiveness of idealized bodies, wondering if liberation is possible. How obscene it is, especially at my age, to feel contempt for the fat on my own torso and thighs. With a mother whose frustrations in life drove her to smoking and drinking and finally overeating and obesity, I am particularly nervous about my body's changes. When Nadia comes back, we lie a long while on the dais, basking and breathing. We speak quietly, not to disturb the others. My words leave my lips and seem to blossom in the slightly steamy air between us. There is a particular joy in this togetherness, a sensual and intellectual joy, for Nadia is the most articulate person I know. <clears throat> she forms her sentences with great care and thought, analyzing events, sensations, and situations. She's ready both to broach all topics and to subject each one to an intense cerebral scrutiny. Yet here we are, naked, her four foot nine body next to my longer, less breasty, larger buttocked one. The proximity of brains and parts enveloped in steam is a heady one, and I would gladly stay here well into the evening. If there is a heaven for the likes of us, feminist intellectuals in an era of dispersal, it will resemble this hammam. Men will be present, but only on certain days. The women will come and go like queens with their attendants. Under a spangled purple ceiling, Nefertiti will make the occasional appearance, condescending to hear our strange intercourse, lifting her head on its stem-like neck, swaying like a lily in incomprehension or amusement. We'll engage her in discussions of monotheism and music and ask her how she keeps her complexion so clear or how she and Akhnaten resolve their philosophical disagreements. Just as we begin to feel a real intimacy, 
She'll float from the room, trailing wet muslin. Breathless, we'll rub our eyes and wonder. I want to have her blessing. Because I have stood before her long enough to think of her as human, I believe that I do have her blessing. She says to me, letting me off the hook, Yes, burn with a hard gem-like flame, but when you can't, you can't. Sometimes I didn't even want Ahnaten's wise, tyrannical, loving hand on my breast. Sometimes the Nile water was bad. My stomach hurt or my head. I am not dainty like a borzoi, but neither in the imperial hammam with her attendants was she. I know, I just know, there were times when she slapped her thigh and roared with laughter, and all the women, fat and thin, roared with her, rollicking in the steam. Thank you. So we thought we'd have a discussion among ourselves. Um, if you know, if, don't don't feel you need to stay. But we would t talk just a little bit, the four of us, and then we would invite you also to to join in. Um, so um, please do stay um, uh, if you want to. And um, I guess I'll start with a question um, that I haven't yet thought of, but it's about to come to me, um, to the others. Um, it has something to do with displacement. I know that. Um, I know that that was the motif that uh, all the work had in common. Also, the question of home and um, what constitutes a home, how a place can become, an ho become a home, um, what it means to have a home, the fact that, in fact, so many of the Earth's population are homeless, so many people are homeless. Um, so I wondered if any of the three of you wanted to sort of speak to that. Um, trains and modernity, trains and displacement, trains and migration. Um, I, 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 there was a minute in one of Fassel's, Fassel's uh, poems where he talked about um, the um, family, the older family who didn't talk about partition. Um, and I know that's a fairly common theme, is not talking about people, people's parents and grandparents not talking about partition. And I know that um, m most of the horrors and atrocities associated with that moment did occur on and around trains. So um, if you want to speak about home and homelessness, if you want to speak about trains and vehicles of transport, um, I invite the three of you to, um, to comment, to think out loud. Anyone want to go first? Well, first of all, it's so, such a pleasure to be with all of you tonight. Um, I would say, and, and, and this, I would say that once you feel, once you're an exile or a child of an exile, you're always exiled. So I would say that I, for instance, have never felt at home anywhere. And the thing that I loved about living in New York City was that everybody was from somewhere else. Um, and and we often would say that we live on a small island off the coast of the United States. Um, so I, I think that once you have felt displaced, you remain displaced. I don't think that you suddenly, you're able to create a home. Um, I'm certainly desperate to create homes all the time, but I never succeed. Thank you. Um, so there's actually a poem I didn't read from, but in the poem I talk about how my parents, their home, um, is their children like that was always what mattered most it's like the next generation the future every displacement every migration that they had experienced led to what us coming next and so and when I think of home it's like who, who am I with who are the people that I'm with the relationships and it's there are places that matter but there's the place is much less important than the people um, who are in whatever place I'm in yeah, I would agree with that. You know, I feel like I was pretty fortunate to um, grow up in a home and not deal with exile or displacement, but I feel like I had the legacy of my grandparents who came to the States from Russia pretty much when they were 15, 16 years old. So you know, as I wrote in the train poem, I sort of picked up pieces of this feeling that I took with me of um, feeling like an outsider and um, sort of relating to this character in the train's poem, Ariel, who says, you know, outside of this land, we have nothing but enemies. Um, so there was that feeling surrounding me, but I feel like sort of growing up and then working with Ethiopian immigrants, 
and watching their process of really coming to Israel with nothing and leaving everything, that home becomes internalized. And once they felt that they um, could be themselves and could function in Israeli society, there was this sense of home that came from within. And it didn't matter as much where they were physically, but just a sense of feeling whole and complete. I was thinking as I was reading my essay how, in, in a way, rarefied that essay is. You know, it's about, it's about pleasure and luxury and lounging around and, um, you know, all sorts, of, all sorts of privileges. And then I was thinking also about the, the sort of the paradox of the museum, that the museum contains all these relics um, and all these pieces of a culture that, um, that, that um, sorry? Someone's saying something. Oh, so, oh, okay. I thought I thought someone was going to help me finish my sentence uh, because I'm, I am improvising. But but it did come to me that you know the museum is full of pieces, parts, metonymies, broken off parts of a culture that actually doesn't exist in that space. It doesn't exist in Germany. You know now with the um, many many refugees who are coming into Germany. Um, it's not just a matter of dead relics, it's a matter of living human beings. And um, sort of this, the strangeness of, of how relics have always been embraced by certain cultures, by Western cultures, for instance, but not necessarily the people associated with those relics. Um, so I was pondering that. Um, I, don't, I don't know if we should continue talking amongst ourselves or whether, whether this is a good moment to take questions from you. Um, if anyone has a question, um, why don't you please shout it out? I'll repeat it so that it gets recorded and so that everyone up here hears it. But what are your thoughts? What are your questions? What would you like to share with us in the way of response to, to what we've read? We've kept you here for a long time. So please, you know, it's your turn. Yeah. Okay, so um, the young man, boy, I'm old enough to say the young man, um, <laughs> said that he just had a statement that home, home is the place where you feel accepted. But do you want to say more about that? Most of my family still lives in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, myself, I was born in Dallas, Texas, but raised in Chicago. Um, so basically, put moving around a lot. I was basically, uh, I'm sorry, this, uh, this is weird. I was uh, displaced multiple times. Uh -huh. uh -huh. I had to use it. I was displaced multiple times uh, through my life and my mother and my father as well. Mm -hmm. And as Faisal said, it seems like with my parents, it was more so home was where I, you know, where children were. Mm -hmm. And uh, with me personally, I just kind of uh, come to a realization that it's more so uh, where you feel like you have a family or you feel like you have a place. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. Any thoughts about that? About the idea that home is where you have your family? What further thoughts about that? No, I agree. That's very true. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes, absolutely. I certainly agree with that. I also think that the, the nature of family can be very complicated because I, I've just talked very personally, not generalized, I'll talk personally. In my own family, because of what my mother and her siblings and my grandmother went through together, you know, huge numbers of separations, reunions, uh, great danger, their drama, their story was the central story, the central narrative of, the, of our lives. And so as the child of that, as the next generation of that, whatever story I had was really much, much more minor. And so it isn't just that, and, and I was an adored child. I mean, I was, you know, the, the beloved of everyone. So it isn't that I wasn't a love child, but my narrative wasn't the central narrative. Theirs was the central narrative. And so it seems to me that one of the questions that one has to ask, and certainly I'm asking, is what are the consequences of what happens in history? 
you know, how does it really impact us? Not in the most dramatic ways, because I mean, obviously, if your life is in danger and you're running away or you have to, you know, cross borders, there's not a question about about the effect. It's terrible. You, you're just trying to survive. But what happens to the next generation? What happens to the impact of that on the people that follow? How does it shape them? And that seems to me to be a really interesting question that, that you know, actions have consequences and lives have consequences. And so home, home is an aspiration for me, but it's not necessarily an arrival. You know, it's an aspiration. I was just thinking about um, that the experience of being the children of displaced persons is what made us writers. Um, it, it, not that every displaced child of a displaced child or displaced, yeah, child of a displaced person it becomes a writer, but for us it seems to have been uh, a driving force in our, in our vocation as writers. Um, do, do you all feel that way? I mean, I feel as though I'm trying to find my way somewhere through language and also trying to tell my, my family's stories, um, tell, trying to express a kind of perpetual discomfort in language so that um, I have created a home for myself in the text that I've made. Is that something that resonates for the three of you? Yeah, I think that feeling of alienation definitely turned me into a writer. And I think language becomes a kind of home, you know, a place where you're safe, and also a place where you can speak for, you know, people who haven't been able to tell their stories, whether it be family who, um, you know, didn't survive, or, you know, I think it's sort of that compassion that we have for other refugees, other people who have been displaced. Um, it definitely turns us into writers and has been the subject, it sounds like, of most of our, a lot of our work, all four of us. I mean, yeah, I mean, the title, the title of my book is The Displaced Children of Displaced Children. And I remember when that phrase came out as I was writing, I said, that's it. That's the idea. Um, I mean, I was born here. I have traveled a lot, but I've always lived in the Chicago suburbs or in the city. And um, when I when I was working on these poems, and it was written over the course of you know twenty plus years, I and mean, the oldest poem in here is from two thousand, but there's fragments from I mean uh, from two thousand, but fragments before that. I was also thinking, even with that poem that I read, the long one, is that sense of I mean you said acceptance. Um, well, there, there are so many layers and circles or spheres in which acceptance happens that I felt accepted at home in my home. When I left home and went to school, then it becomes a different question of, okay, who is this brown-skinned or funny-named sound, funny named person? Um, I'm, a, I'm a Muslim being Muslim in America right now. It's, it's that question of, do you belong here? Are you a threat to this place? And to internalize other people's perceptions of us and to say, well, this is who I am, but this is how I am seen. And there's a, there's a displacement because there's a difference there. Like, this is who I am. I'm not someone who subscribes to the, the fear, you know, the, the things that make people afraid, but people are still afraid, whether it's of me individually or to the groups to which I belong. And when you're, when you're thinking on that level of how am I seen, how am I seen, that sense of uh, displacement becomes a psychological displacement too, like I'm here, mm -hmm. but I don't feel that sense of acceptance necessarily. And I know for a lot of people that that's like their, day-to-day, -day like I don't on a moment-to-moment -moment feel rejected or discrimination in that sense, but the, the fact that it could happen and it has happened does create this kind of consciousness of like, hold on a second, am I really safe right now in, in, in terms of how I am seen? So that like as the poems continue, there's a, there's a lot of that, not just my own story, but other people's stories of that sense of like, okay, what is it that um, shapes people's perceptions of others? And how do their behaviors, um, how, do the, how do the perceptions impact their behavior? Like, what are the con like you said, what are the consequences of history? That's, that's the, the, the I mean, for all of us, that is what it's about. Like, we are the consequences of the history of the people before all of us are. Yeah, I'm, yes. Uh, I was just going to say that, I, this is just an anecdote, but when I was a child, I never felt that 
except within my family, where I felt, as I say, very loved. I never felt that I, I could fit in anywhere because, because we were these peculiar Hungarian Jews who celebrated Christmas, the Jews in the community that I grew up in just thought we were peculiar. You know, why were we doing that? And there's a whole history to that, why Hungar Hungarian Jews celebrate Christmas. It's not because they convert, it's because of other things. So anyway, so there was that. Then, then I went to a Jewish summer camp because my mother wanted me to have a, a Jewish identity. But because I didn't look like most Jewish kids, they decided I was an Arab because I'm Sephardic. My father's family was Sephardic. So they thought that I was Arab. So the Jews thought I was Arab. The Christians didn't like me because I was Jewish. Um, my family thought the whole thing was ridiculous because they were all socialists and they didn't have any religious feeling, but they were completely identified as Jews. So nothing made any sense. There was absolutely no place that I could fit in that made any particular sense. The one place that I could fit in was through language, through writing, and trying to make sense out of things. Um, and the first poem I ever wrote, I like to tell this story, the first poem I ever wrote went like this. Birds and words are funny things. Birds and words mean many things. That was my first poem. And I, <laughs> I think that the idea that nothing gets fixed, nothing is stable, Meaning isn't stable, identity isn't stable. That was with me very early on. And I think that that has propelled me in my relationship to language all along, which is, you know, the multiplicity of possible meanings haunts me all the time. And I think that is also related to the multiplicity of identities. You know, what am I? I don't know. Okay, so I'll repeat your question. Yes. My question is What are your thoughts about those people's rights to keep the place they choose? The, the, the way it was when they choose it, and they suddenly think changed. You know, uh, there's a lot of hypocrisy about that. I see that I'm from Poland, I came here like 40 years ago, and my mom is very religious, I'm not much, my wife is black. We do. American art and international art, you know, so they, but, so right now there's a lot of discussion about it, but people write to defend their home, their way of life. How far you can go? So the gentleman is asking about, I don't know why I went young man and gentleman, but it seems like I don't, <laughs> the, the, person the person in the blue shirt is, well, there's more than one of those, is, Okay. Okay. So it has something to do, your question has something to do with, with people who want to keep a place static, right? Like it's this, it, it will always be the same and whether that is, is appropriate or... Uh, okay. And then... Okay. Okay, and then they want it to stay a certain way. Like you go to uh, Holland and they say, we smoke marijuana and we enjoy porn and they do this videotape for Muslim people who comes to Holland. This is our way of life. <laughs> so okay. you, should, you should understand. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to phrase, how to rephrase all of that, but does anybody have thoughts? Like, I was this is not the maybe the best for me. I, I, to think that any place can anything or any person, any place can stay the same seems unrealistic and impossible. Yeah. 
even, even values. I mean, even even and I think about an individual and how as that person grows up, their values evolve. They're shaped by the people around them. Their relationships evolve. And so I think, I think a person can say, I want things to stay or remain a certain way, but to expect them to actually stay a certain way seems un, unrealistic to me. So, th there's, so that which I'm, which for me means that there's always going to be some tension uh, between people that want things to stay a certain way and the people that are pushing a change, whether actively always or not. Moving. Always moving. Whether it's, I don't think it's about a direction, but it's about a constant a constant motion that, you know, I, th I think for us who are like children of immigrants or people that are in multiple identity spheres, like that's normal to be traveling through fluid, or having a fluid existence, depending, like what, what I'm like in my home is different than what I'm like outside my home. And so I can, I'm comfortable with multiple ways of existence in the same life. And I think th there's going to be different comfort levels with that. And I think people who are more equipped to dealing with change are going to be more open to change. And so I, I don't, it's not an answer, but I think it's just when I think of your question, I think of like the impossibility of anything, any person or place staying static. So Nari, do you want to ask your question and we'll make it the last question of the evening because I've just looked at my watch and realized that, that the evening is coming to an end or? Okay. So one was for Paso, and it was interesting that your choice of Casado for, uh, for a format of one of your poems, I'm wondering if you found the strictures of writing a Casado actually was an interesting framework for you to be more creative than to just approach poetry as a free form kind of a, uh, exercise. And the second one is that we're talking about displacement and using the word transnational even as the theme for the evening, which is a very interesting theme to be using these days. It's become very, very fashionable to be using it. But when you look at the body of American literature beyond the last few decades, the ones that are really, the American writers that are comfortable writing about being displaced and being transnational, it basically becomes pretty much a body of American Jews. Uh, <laughs> the other ethnicities of Americans we're not as much in liberty, I guess, to write about being displaced without having their patriotism questioned somehow. Mm -hmm. And but I'm not saying that that's necessarily a negative thing. But as for us, who are contemporaries, we're thinking about being transnational. Does that offer a body of work for us to look at as a template for future? Okay. So there were two questions. One um, to Fossil about his choice of the, the guzzle or guzzle form uh, and whether he felt in some way liberated, you know, paradoxically liberated by the restrictions of the form. Um, and I'll let him answer that and then I'll repeat the second question. And I, and I th I, the question about form, I think all, all poets, I think we all work in form. And I think the there, there are two guzzles in the poem. The, mo the most common form I have in the book are acrostics, and acrostics are you know the, the poems that the, the first letter of each line spells something out. I, I don't announce them as acrostics, but th whenever there's a form, there's a restriction, and whenever there's a restriction, there's some place that I cannot go, that I may want to go, and because I can't go there, I have to come up with new places that this line has to go, and it's always a sense of discovery there. And so I, I like the form because of the restriction, because it's. But sometimes I don't want the restriction. And so I, I will work it. I, I, I'm assuming that's how all of us, like, there are forms, there are times for form and times for where we don't want, to want that restriction. But I love restrictions. I do love the forms when they are present. Any other thoughts about form or? I'll just talk for a minute about the pantoum, because I find the structure of the pantoum, which is repetitive, has been really exciting to work in. and I always find new discoveries. And so I want to move away from the kind of language that I usually use, or the kind of images, by forcing that kind of repetition. It always moves me in new directions. And I'm actually with a group of people who are writing group pantoums about gun violence right now. And so we take turns with different lines, and it's really fascinating also working with someone else's language and having to move with their meaning and find our own meaning as we sort of ricochet off each other's lines. So I find that it does offer freedom, but I agree there are times when, it's, um, when it does get in the way. 
and you know I'll choose to move in another direction. Well, I'm going to be contrarian. I actually don't work in received forms at all, ever. Um, not because I dislike them, I just don't do it. It's just not how I work. But I'm very attentive to the idea of form and the way you know, that famous um, conversation between Robert Creeley and Charles Olson, where one of them says, form is never more than an extension of content, and the other one says, vi and vice versa. So I'm always interested in the relationship between form and content. And in this new book, there are many prose poems, which is not something I ever worked in before. But somehow, I work with constraints rather than forms. And one of the constraints was actually temporal, because I was trying to write something every single day, late at night when I didn't have much time. And somehow these small prose pieces seem to make sense in that, in that context. So I'm always looking to ask the question, is the form the right form for this content? And is this content working well with the form? But I, I've never worked with received forms. It could be because I never studied poetry formally. You know, I got a PhD in literature and I never actually studied poetry. You know, I never got an MFA. So um, I really trained myself and trained myself in sort of an experimental tradition. I, I, Ira, do we have time to answer Nari's second question, or should we shut up shop? I think people have sat here for a long time. Maybe. I think it's worth taking a, taking a minute. Is it? Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> so Nari's second question, if I remember it, um, had to do with much of the literature in the American literature of immigration and displacement having been written by Jews. And only in more recent uh, generations has there has it been has has there been an outpouring um, from other other immigrant groups, and to what extent, if I understood correctly, you were asking to what extent um, do those later later coming immigrant groups, um, although not all of them are later coming, right? Because there were Chinese Americans, there were Italian Americans, there were Irish Americans, and so on all along. But to what extent did that literature of displacement by Jews provide a kind of an inspiration, maybe, or a um, template for the later later writers on displacement? Yeah. Um, wow. That's that's quite. I mean, that's that is that's a question to write a paper on, right? I, you know, not not necessarily to answer spontaneously, but but some of you may have answers. I was just thinking when when um, when. Um, when Fassel was talking a minute ago about how important, how much the concept that W. B. E. B. Du Bois's concept of double consciousness resonates, I think, for every ethnic group and immigrant group in this country. But that doesn't answer that question. Um, I don't, off the cuff, have an answer to that question, which I really want to ponder. Do any of you? I was just going to say it's a dissertation, not a paper, <laughs> in terms of being a significant question. Um, there's a glib answer, which is that, um, I don't know that this answers the question of influence, but the fact that so many Jews wrote about it, I think has to do with the fact that Jewish culture is so deeply steeped in the book. They're called the people of the book. Yeah, and the history of displacement, which is central to Jewish experience from way, 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 way back. So it's almost in the blood. To be displaced is to be in the blood. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure that we, you know, Jews have a corner on that. I think there are other displaced cultures um, who could speak eloquently about that. But uh, I think that has something to do with it. Okay.
I, I, my answer would be yes. I mean, I know when I think of the the writers, I mean, I, I feel like I, I, I've always tried to read every a writer of every group or background. And um, I think one thing about Jewish writers that appealed to me is that these are non-Christians in a mostly Christian country. And how have they navigated a religious identity that is, I mean, it's monotheistic or it's Abrahamic, which for Muslims that we can identify or at least participate in that identity. But it's not the mainstream. And there, there's a sense of being an outsider. And so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe, I mean, and hopefully, hopefully it will. What? Yeah. No, I mean, hopefully it will happen. I, I think when I look around right now, this, I mean, uh, is that there's so many writers from different backgrounds, different perspectives that are writing right now. The the poetry world for me, I mean, I feel like it's like the most dynamic time. Maybe I'm just because I'm more recently entering into it, but it's a really dynamic time. And, I, and that sense of like, what have other people been through? What are their experiences like before us? Before I mean, the the now before the now. What was their experience like? How is it similar and different from us? And what can we learn from that in terms of like how they navigate the experiences on the page and with language, but also like just the the content? And so, I mean, that it's absolutely been influential. Um, Jewish writers, but also any group that has had to struggle to forge an identity as an American. Okay, everybody up. Yes. You've, you've all, you all have your own experience of displacement and your families have your own experience of displacement, but a, a term that hasn't been mentioned is empathy. And what you're all doing, I mean, I think you're, all four of you wrote um, about your efforts as writers to empathize with the, dis, with the experience of other displaced people, whether it's Nefertiti or the guy in the, in the court case that you wrote the poem about. And I just wanted to kind of underline that because that's what writers do right and also we're living in a time when god knows we could do with more empathy in this country and so i just sort of wanted to thank you for reflecting on displacement in a way that involves empathizing this act of empathizing with the experience of, of other displaced people that's a lovely way to conclude things and uh from your accent i gather that you too are displaced um, <laughs> yes, empathy. Let's end on that note. Empathy. I think that's very important. Thank you. <laughs>